Hi, my name is Brenda Alderete. Welcome to Off the Stage. We're here at the Made Life Studio with Gary James Jones. I'm Sean Piquet. I'm a music mentor here at Made Life in composition and electronic music. I'm very thrilled with the opportunity to talk a little bit more with Gary in here today, who performs as Clinker. I've seen it, seen him a couple of times um, perform in the States, once at the Thought Festival in Missoula, and he was just out here at the Atlas Black Box performing next to Neil for the Community Electronic Art and Music Festival. Gary, welcome. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank how, you. How are you? Oh, I'm having the time of my life here in Boulder. Yeah, yeah? It's amazing. Do you want to tell our audience where you're from? I'm from Edmonton, Canada, uh, which is pretty much directly north from here. Mm -hmm. Quite a few thousand miles, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's about a four-hour flight straight north. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, it's your first time in Boulder. It is. And I've, yeah, this has been a destination location for me for many years. I met uh, some people that are really involved in the art scene here at Mutech when I was there in 2007. And ever since there, I've been dying to get to this oasis. And, or at least that's how it was described. And boy, it didn't disappoint. Yeah, it certainly is an artistic oasis here. Yeah, well, it's just so meticulous on lots of different levels, I'm noticing, actually. Mm. Yeah, it's been fun. Good. And can you talk about the environment or the t collectives that best support your work? In Edmonton? Um, yeah, the city, it's been, you know, I sort of uh, unveiled the new somatics work that most of the stuff I've been working on and stuff that I performed here, uh, I started from there. Um, but I guess the, you know, there's festivals like Mutech, Electra Festival, New Forms Festival, and then the nice thing was a fantastic new festival in Montana called Dat Festival, which I'd highly recommend. Mm -hmm. They brought me out last year, and um, and uh, the curator from Communique saw my performance there and then invited me to come this year to Boulder. So yeah, I guess it's those communities that I think really support the you know the performance of audiovisual and live cinema work, you know the best. You know they provide. Uh, the right environment, uh, the right, you know, you need a, you really do require a nice big large screen, high quality video and a uh, high quality PA system to really, to, d to do mm -hmm. this art form justice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they definitely provided that on Friday. Mm -hmm. Excellent. How do you feel your work uh, may influence the way people relate to sound? Uh, I think the biggest goal for me is um, trying to open people's ears up and um, you know, we talk about the idea of deep listening, um, going deeper into sound. Um, a lot of the work I do, I think, on the surface would, would you know, could be perceived as a solid tone or drone. Um, but I'm relating it more to going back into minimalist music, minimalist classical music, ambient music. And in those forms of music, it's all about uh, the layers of subtlety that are inside of that. And if you give it some time, and you open your ears up, it's almost like a symphony of subtlety will open up and you, there's a lot going on inside something that maybe on the surface seems quite, you know, static and, and simple. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, my favorite thing about it is just how deep you can go into it and how your ears can open up. And um, I think the goal for my music is to provide opportunities for people to open their ears up and kind of expand and go deeper into sound. Uh, and with this new work, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm bringing a visual aspect to that where using the science of somatics, I'm able to actually show the audience what the sound is actually look, look looks like, you know, a way of making the invisible visible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would argue that for me, seeing the physical manifestation of sound is gives it another dimension that I haven't really gotten to see before. I've been a fan of somatics, but I've never seen an AV performance like yours. Yeah. I think it's important. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's fun to do. So you mentioned this idea of drone and listening into it and deep listening. Um, I'm wondering if you could connect a little bit more between that uh, understanding of drone and the minimalist history from which it derives and how you feel, you know, you relate to it. And, um, and in particular, what drone does for you and how it functions for your particular body of work. Uh, well, yeah, that, let me see here. When I first got int introduced to ambient music, um, again, I, c I came from playing in, in metal bands and hard rock bands, and it was, you know, I was really, that's all I listened to for many years. So it was a whole other level of listening and a whole different vocabulary of listening that I feel I kind of had to learn. Uh -huh. um, my entry point in for, like, for many probably would be Brian Eno's music. 
But uh, I started researching, you know, what were his influences, and you go back, and it's like, you know, artists like Steve Reich and Lamont Young and mm -hmm. all these guys um, doing, you know, classical minimalist sort of work and stuff like that relates to it. Um, I don't know, with drone, I mean, there's just so much inside the sound of drone that uh, uh, attracts me, and um, I don't know. Hopefully I answered your question. I'm not sure if I did. <laughs> 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 Trying to. Um, yeah, it's just, it's it, 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 it's coming at you, in a, it can be such an immense sound, but and you can just fall into it and just envelops mm -hmm. you. One thing I've, I've, I really always try to achieve is it's what I describe as the warm hug, you know, where the sound mm -hmm. is so big and it's just like, you're just feeling it's enveloping it. Yeah, you it's just enveloping you yeah. and you're just like sitting in it going, man, this feels great, yeah. you know? So hopefully at some point in most of my performances, I, I crescendo to to a point like that and um it can get pretty intense and then there's usually some kind of a reprieve or or you know a healing after or mm -hmm. a little, some some breath after to take people out grace you know gracefully mm -hmm. i think it's important um because yeah for some people it can be an extreme experience but i you know that's good art's supposed to push sometimes too right yeah so yeah I think so. yeah good. um could you elaborate on like particularly with regarding the visual and sonic components of your work. So how this alignment or misalignment between like these thin aesthetic experiences that people undergo in, in your concerts and in your performances and installations, um, how does that alignment misalignment really function and how do you think about it uh, in regards to what you're doing? Um, okay, yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm trying to set up opportunities for people to find their way their own path through mm -hmm. uh, the work and you know I've almost I just feel like a catalyst so I'm essentially building an opportunity for people um, I often have people come up to me and said man you took me on this crazy journey and, yeah. and I'm like no actually you took yourself on that journey mm -hmm. I just kind of created the bed work for you to op you know I op opened up an opportunity for you to explore this and right. but you did all this this so was it's you. like a roadmap or a series of possibilities that yeah realize. yeah and relating to like somatics and the you know the visual aspect the synesthesia that you're talking about mm -hmm. um, I mean it, it flips because it you know when you're playing with a true representation of a visualization like what we're how it works essentially is I'm you know I'm finding resonance in these metal plates and this uh, wave driver machine that I've built and it's right. all based on resonance which is a you know basically a self amplification moment where it gets really really violent actually mm -hmm. and there's enough energy the sound wave moves through the plate and I have particulate sand on it and it actually reveals the wave shape of the actual image um, so I mean that is a synesthetic moment right there you're actually seeing a sound or you know because it's based in this physical yeah, and you're, phenomenon. Yeah, exactly. It gives you an opportunity to actually see something that is, you know, sound obviously is not visible. For sure. And it, yeah, it's it's a way of, um, yeah, facilitates a viewing of it, I guess. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Interesting, yeah. Uh, beyond perception of sound and visuals interacting, uh, or at least being relatable to some degree, uh, what? In what way are you interested in like more uh, deeper structural interactions between sound and visuals? For example, wavelength as the de describable parameter of both sound and light, and then higher order constructions like timbre and color. Okay, yeah. So essentially, I work very intuitively when it, when I'm working with sound. So I usually, I'll start with the sound. Um, you know, it's usually just as simple as like grabbing my oscillator and finding a pitch that just. Right. feels right in the moment mm -hmm. and and then responding to it and you know getting you know sequencers involved or modulations um, modulating different tones uh, relating you know isn't bringing in a harm harmonic tone listening yeah. oh maybe I want it to beat a little bit so I'll slightly detune it you know so it's it's so a very process based making slight yeah. changes yeah. and then listening to those changes and how they yeah and, the and re what's really important i think is giving time like to actually make a move and actually sit and really listen to what's happening and give it a, a moment to like okay yeah this is working for me and then responding again it's, uh, so that tone might be sitting in a certain frequency range and then moving into right. you know and the idea of a composition you know not always but often you're trying to fill up a, f a more full range kind of thing Sometimes, you know, a, a composition will sit in a certain area and then 
move around, mm -hmm. drop down low for a while, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really ever have uh, a real necessary, necessarily road map in front of me. Mm -hmm. It's pretty abstract when I start. Um, it's different when I'm doing film composing or something like yeah. that. It's, you know, I approach that differently, but for the work that's related to Clinker and what I did here in Boulder on Friday, yeah, that's definitely the approach. Um, and obviously, um, all the sounds that I'm working on now that relate to this have a visual component sure. because I start with that essentially, you know, I started with making all these, these animations and the rest of it is, uh, you know, a, a response to that with synthesizers or I bring my voice into it. Mm -hmm. uh, the end of the sh piece is, um, you know, I start again, I bring in this, this simple pure tone. We see the Mandela, uh, a waveform that is, uh, represented by that tone. Mm -hmm. um, and then I do a vocal piece where I layer and stack up a harmonic piece with my voice right. um, and kind of play with some overtone singing a little bit and stuff like that. Um, you know, that's after the big bass drop moment where I feel like I kind of have to like heal people a little bit after. Yeah, bring them down. Yeah, bring them down a little bit. Yeah, because yeah, yeah, anybody that was there would, would probably, um, you know, remember the big bass drop moment that I did. It was, it was pretty intense. Oh yeah. It was fun. <laughs> it was great. Yeah. yeah. It's like the big warm hug. Yeah. yeah. I like that stuff. Or like the aftercare, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> cool. Um, how do you seek out as somebody who uses new technologies, how do you seek out, identify, and ultimately choose to engage with particular technologies that support your work? Do the technologies interest you and then you shape new possibilities for your work by engaging with them? Or do you have an idea and concept that drives you to explore technological solutions for realizing something? Yeah, I mean, I think it flips. Like, I'm definitely in, you know, in, in the geek camp, so I'm always like looking at tech and mm -hmm. um, looking what other artists are using in their pieces and, you know, Hey, sensors, you know, all these different right. Arduino circuits, all these different things that are available to us now um, uh, to build these, you know, immersive spaces or interactive spaces. Um, but oftentimes, uh, you know, when you, I'll, I'll look for technology when I have a problem to solve. Mm -hmm. And then I'll basically, you know, kind of like, hey, what's available that could help me create this experience? And then I'll go in and learn that technology or often, Sometimes I'll even hire experts in the field that will help me actually develop, um, you know, and prototype el certain electronics or, you know, things that I might need that are mm -hmm. beyond my personal programming skills or something like that. Um, and that helps you stay focused on what you care about and what you... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I can actually stay more and like really um, focused on the experience I'm trying to mm -hmm. get, get to. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I have a really good, you know, uh, group of friends that are you know, pretty geeky out, geeking yeah. out all the time too. And I can often go, you know, you know, what kind of sensor would work best for this? Or, you know, would it be an IR sensor, infrared? Should it be right. sonar? You know, should it be, you know, I saw that, that, that uh, light chandelier that was presented here mm -hmm. and there, she was using lasers as the triggers. And right. I actually am currently building a big installation in Edmonton right now. And there's a really long distance that I'm going to have to actually trigger from. And I was like thinking about lasers now. Lasers could work. Yeah, right? lasers mm -hmm. could work. Yeah. They pass such a nice distance, right? Yeah. And there's Whereas limitations to IR. IR. Yeah. And so sonar has like inherent limitations. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think sonar, uh, I've, you, they, you know, it's, yeah, you're right. There, is, there are limitations to it sonar too. It gets really too diffuse. And right. It bounces off it too much. Yeah, stuff. you're right. So, you know, yeah, it's interesting to come here and then I'm looking around all, I'm always trying to pay attention to what everyone yeah. else is doing and learn from everybody. Um, so yeah, I guess it really depends on where I'm at in the piece that I'm working on or, um, yeah, you know, and again, the same thing with like modular synths, like I've been playing with synthesizers for years. Mm -hmm. Um, and my main, one of my main synths was a Nord modular, which is sort of digital, um, version of modular synth. Mm -hmm. And then when they, you know, this new wave of Euro rack or Euro right. crack, as they they call it, <laughs> uh, it, it <laughs> that came up. Oh, it's insane! <laughs> it becomes, yeah, yeah. yeah I was, um, yeah, just uh, pushing. Yeah, always looking. Yeah. You have to always keep paying paying attention in this art form. There's always new mm -hmm. developments and stuff to make things sometimes easier, so, but usually better. You know. Yeah. And sometimes it's just a really, really simple solution. Like honestly. The machine that I'm doing all this work with, it's a really basic machine. It's a speaker and I've fabricated a way of, you know, directing the energy from a voice coil to a metal plate. Right. 
um, the thing that I'm really, what I did, you know, really was caring about was the source material. So it's a really, really high quality sine wave to a really, really high quality amplifier yeah. to the plate. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, I guess I kind of wanted to rule out the idea ever in my mind of, man, right. could this be better if it was like a better quality thing? So I tried, yeah. you know, fortunately, I was in a position to be able to rule that one out. Yeah. Um, and then we get into like, you know, eventually it's such a volatile experiment I, experiment that I'm running is, you know, and I, I always eventually blow up the speaker and then have to build a new one and, <laughs> and keep going through that. So, but yeah. that's actually led me to some pretty you probably exciting new stuff. Get better each time around, and you can make modifications. Yeah, well, I eventually I built an air cooling system, and <laughs> I built a level, and, and I, you know, keep modifying this leveling system for uh -huh. it. And once I added the air cooling system, it just the whole motor was running way more efficiently, and actually the resolution of the images got crisper, uh -huh. and you know, and the speakers would last longer until before I blew them up. You know, it's great. great. So yeah, because yeah, it's expensive. Exactly. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> you, you've kind of been talking a little bit about the peregrination um, setup. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about how much of that makes it to the live performance or what fractions of your actual setup do you take into the live performance? Sure, for peregrination, I mean, it's, it's, it's really quite, it's impossible for me to take this machine and perform it. First of all, like, every one of those animations or moments that we're taking through that that may have taken me anywhere from two to four hours in the studio kind of shaping finessing moving and getting those moments mm -hmm. so it, it really takes it's a really slow uh, evolution in the moment of finding those beautiful scenes and um you know it's often like okay i'm looking at it and it's doing one thing and i'm like oh man if i add a little bit of modulation in this sub area and i'll take you know, you know, make that connection on the modular and then bring it in and often does something exactly opposite of what I thought it would do. But mm -hmm. then it's, but that's like easily pretty great, mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, wait. And then that'll, <laughs> you know, intuitively kind of trigger your, and go into another direction. But uh, the plate itself and the machine runs at such a high volume, like um, it wouldn't work. Uh, and, and, the, and the machines themselves, like I said, I'm blowing them up all the time. So you can't really count on that, you know, when you're, yeah. you're showing up to do a show and like sorry guys no show i just blew the just speaker yeah. you know yeah. like sorry yeah. um you know i was thinking about ways of like encasing it in plexiglass or something like that but i mean i really kind of have to touch it and be close to it so i haven't had a, you know i don't know what the solution is but f so the solution that i've done is i've you know i'm in the moment videotaping uh, all the audio you hear is an, a direct microphone right up against it. So you're actually literally hearing the tone that I, I you know, I drew the image with. Yeah. And and then I bring it into like a performance software. Uh, the one that I'm using now is called Resolum. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. And essentially it's, uh, the you know, what peregrination is in the live sense is me moving through a composition and taking people on a journey through all these different moments. And then, uh, you know, the skill and technique and, and artistically mixing video and sound together and and keeping all that together triggering things in the right moment how long am i going to leave that that sort of enters into this sort of improvisational kind of camp mm -hmm. so uh, you know no performance is ever truly alike right, um, right. you're like djing and vjing your own original work yeah yeah and then you know adding the voice and adding mm -hmm. other synthesizer layers and stuff like that to it and you know again yeah trying to take people on a journey mm -hmm. but i'm also like the sole performer so you know I'm mixing video and sound and live, but you know, you kind of have to, there's only so much that you can do. And there's there's often times where you have to let something, okay, I'm gonna let that play for a while and I'm gonna move over here. And this is what I'm concentrating now. I'm gonna sing and then, I'll, you know, slowly, you know, change some kind of effect parameter or something like that. But um, yeah, so it's, that's that's what peregrination is. And um, that's my approach, I guess, in, in the live, in the live, you know, how I deliver it, mm -hmm. yeah. You've been talking a lot about your upcoming exhibition, Broken Sound, um, which ironically is a result of many blown speakers from your other pieces. Can you tell us a little bit more about this next piece and how this guides a presentation that is new and unique for you? Sure. Yeah, it's an exciting period for me. I'm just, like like you said, I'm opening up a new exhibition in Edmonton, my city. i um, been working on this piece for about two years. Uh, you know, as I move through making all the somatics work and all the gallery work um, and live work that I've been doing, we've been talking about, yes, I've got this room full of blown speakers that are sitting there. 
um, earlier on, um, I'd actually open them up and I was looking at them while they were being, you know, right after I'd blow them up and go, okay, what's the problem here? What, what's happening inside yeah. the machine? And I recognized in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. Boy, those are just destroyed. Like, <laughs> holy, did I ever fry that one? And, you know, I didn't really yeah. ever, at the point, at that point, I didn't really anticipate I would ever actually use that in an art project. Mm -hmm. But as time went on, I started recognizing, and as I'd pull them pull these voice coils apart the range of different um, damage that had been done to them some some machines died very early so they're like this perfect golden um, like very n n not scarred at all um, and over time like this range there's all these different colors of blackening and darkening and scarring mm -hmm. and like some of them are like they're just absolutely destroyed and I started to see this parallel of this idea of this life cycle where we as humans start as these perfect golden mm -hmm pure beings, pure tones. And as we age, you know, we move through time and we, we darken and we scar. And there's this beautiful process to that as we age. And then there's the break. And the break to me, like when you actually look at the coils that actually have snapped, to me that's like a document of the moment of silence. So it's just like, wow, there's some interesting stuff here to explore. Because that, I, I, this is right there, what we're looking at is the moment that that sound died, literally. It, mm -hmm. it just instantly went off. I thought, wow, that's like death. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I decided to explore this idea of building this piece, this life cycle piece that moves through. Um, and when you frame these voice coils with, you know, really, you know, high magnification lenses, uh, it's just amazing the world that's inside there. Like the, the coil wire is just, you know, slightly uh, thicker than a human hair. Mm -hmm. And in s when you blow it up and you see this mark making and this beautiful sculptural work that's been happening, like ironically in the background as I've been frying these things, mm -hmm. and I was just like, wow, yeah. this is amazing. <laughs> and I just you know, saw all this potential in you know, trying to make a piece out of it. So, so it's about recognizing that kind of emergent sculptural process that's taking yeah. place yeah, and by using those materials and then overusing them absolutely and in a way it's like you know as artists we talk about the happy accident and how mm -hmm. you know we always have to embrace those moments because they're often the best right and this was something you know th there was all this five years of happy accident happening as these speakers were going oh you're killing me <laughs> right and me coming back and yeah. you just had to recognize it i did have to recognize it and kind of look at it wow there's actually a theme here um mm -hmm. that presented itself you start you know conceptual theme mm -hmm. so yeah Pretty, really excited about That's it. Very cool. Thanks. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing pictures or anything that you'll do to showcase that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Yeah, it's essentially it's going to be for. Well, the other thing that tied into this that I maybe should mention is, uh, and this kind of relates. To, it's interesting because I know there's a big Buddhist um, movement here in mm -hmm. Boulder, but I was I was told of this Buddhist allegory of a monk sitting in, and meditating in front of this infinitely um, massive stone wheel and this wheel was slowly rotating towards the monk and it was rumored that if the monk there was a there's rumored that there was a crack in this wheel mm -hmm. and if the monk ever saw this crack in this wheel then that was the moment of enlightenment but the irony is his whole life passes him by in the intention of the gaze that it takes to to look for that to attend to that so i'm looking at these round voice coils and i'm like oh my god these are like the stone wheel mm -hmm. and there's yeah. the crack and i was like that was the other so the presentation of this installation is like four massive large screens right. that are flipped on the vertical mm -hmm. and you see this sublime line work falling towards you and then the composition uh, mm -hmm. you know it starts off with the pure golden tone simple tone mm -hmm. one tone and then slowly starts building up overtones and I create a meditative meditative space that will will the audience and myself I'm gonna sit inside of it a lot right. I can't, well I haven't just yeah that. yeah I can't wait to set it up and turn it all on because right. it's been I've done it in a smaller scale in my studio but to actually cool. you know experience it in the in the space is gonna be exciting I inst start I start installing it on Saturday mm -hmm. so as soon as I go home that's my, the next thing I do that's exciting cool yeah, thanks. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. It's been a genuine pleasure. Yeah, and again, a delight to see your performance again. I look forward to seeing more of those in, in the States. Thanks. Me too. <laughs> thank you, Boulder. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Made life.